book of Jude this morning. I'm going to read one verse. Verse number 7. <clears throat> even as Sodom and Gomorrah in the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now here Jude, we don't have time to get into everything that's going on here, but Jude's talking about those that have been examples. Verse number 6, he talks about the angels which sided with Satan rather than doing their duty, doing what they were created for and serving God. We know that a third of the angels in heaven sided with Lucifer. They were cast out of heaven. So if God, sparing not the angels which left their first estate, as verse number 6 says, and then verse number 7, he says also Sodom and Gomorrah being set forth as an example even until that day, even until some 2,000 years later to this day. So, we know that Sodom and Gomorrah, very wicked town. We know that Abram, later Abraham, went to God and said, Lord, if there were a hundred righteous men in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, would you save them? And that he kept decreasing the number until they got down to ten, and God said, I'd save the city for ten righteous men. Then Abraham stopped. God didn't stop. God didn't cut Abraham off. That Abraham thought surely Lot, his nephew, and his family, which if you study it out would have been ten people, surely they are still living righteously. Now we can go over to the book of Hebrews, and it says Hebrew refers to Lot as being a just man. Okay, but it says that he was a just man whose soul was vexed by the location that he was in. It was vexed daily. Right? But Lot was a just and righteous man, but Lot's family wasn't all hitched up to the same wagon that Lot was. Well, we know that Sodom and Gomorrah was consumed with fire. Here it says, was set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. What kind of fire did God pour out on Sodom and Gomorrah? The same kind of fire I believe that you'll find in hell. It's an eternal fire. How do you know that? You still can't find Sodom and Gomorrah. It got burned up. If a fire stopped, you can go and find the remains of it. Sodom and Gomorrah was consumed utterly. Uh, well, not just that, it also said the cities of the plain, but we don't have time to go and correct people that just think Sodom and Gomorrah was the only thing that got swallowed up that day. But here in verse number 7, I was reading, thinking about that phrase there, it set forth, or set forth, for an example. And I think there's a whole lot of examples throughout the Bible. But what's the point of an example? An example is not set forth by me, not set forth by a preacher. It says set forth for an example of God. God left an example, but then God preserved it in His Word, which is exalted above his very own name so that from the day it was penned down until this very day God intended you to know the example and to know the reasoning behind the example the point of an example is for you to glean the wisdom that somebody else had to learn the hard way the point of an example is to shortcut a lot of heartache and a lot of pain and a lot of misery in your life because you can see one that didn't learn the lesson and had to suffer the consequences of it. Set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You know what vengeance is? First off, we know vengeance is mine, say it's the Lord. When God takes his vengeance, what he's literally doing is correcting the wrong that contradicts his holiness. God made everything in a sinless, perfect, holy state. At one point, man, Adam and Eve in the garden, were holy because that's how God made them. Because everything that God does is holy. When they chose to sin, they fell to sin. They died that day, spiritually. And physically, they began 
to start dying that day. But, all that being said, when Adam, when Eve sinned, gave to Adam, Adam chose to sin as well. Death passed upon all men. God's intention for Adam and Eve was never to die. It was to continually be in the Garden of Eden. That he would have fellowship with them in the Garden of Eden for all of eternity. I believe that at some point, if they had to start having youngins, they would have dwelled eternally in the Garden of Eden or on the face of the earth as God instructed them to. That they would have tended the Garden of God. But they didn't choose to do that. What that do? That insulted God's holiness. Because in His holiness, God made man holy. Every day that man is not holy, it stands as a testament to the fact that we chose to do something that God didn't want us to do. We rejected what God wanted and substituted what we wanted. When you start thinking about that, those things like long-suffering and grace and mercy and the fact that God looked on us in compassion and love rather than in vengeance, you really start appreciating all them years before you got saved, all those times that you could have walked off into eternity but God didn't allow it before you got saved, and then you start to appreciate that God would have been justified not just to kill me before I got saved, but throw me off into hell for things I've done after I've gotten saved. Vengeance is something that God is entitled to, but he chooses to delay it for your benefit. One day God's going to recompense unto man, unto the world, unto the devil, unto all throughout all time that have rejected his goodness and his grace and his mercy. But God would be entitled to do it today. He's justified to do it today. The only reason he doesn't is for the benefit of those that would suffer his vengeance. He wants to give them a space of grace in order to get right. But see, when God pours out his vengeance, people take note. When God recompenses unto man what they deserve, the fruits of their labor, that it's never good. First example, we'll get to Sodom and Gomorrah here in a second, but we're going to go back further than that. Because Sodom and Gomorrah was without excuse. We go back to the days of Noah. First example we want to look at today would be those that were swallowed by the sea. In Noah's day, the Bible says the end times, which is how we know we're getting and in the end times, that we're getting real close to the end of this calendar that God's got. is because in the last days, it shall be as in the days of Noah, where man's thoughts were continual, or evil continually. Everything that they desired was evil, contrary to what God said, contrary to what God had instructed Adam and Eve after they had sinned, contrary to those things that Abel and Seth embraced, and they had gone the way of Cain, which was rejecting what God expected and substituting what they desired. They wanted God to be impressed with what they offered God. They did not want to humble themselves to give unto God what God requested. Or what God demanded. See, those that were swallowed by the sea, their example, first off, you can't do what you want to do and then not have to pay the cost. There's always a price. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man so that shall he also reap. Just because God showed mercy today does not mean that God's mercy will extend to tomorrow. Just because God did not today, even though we know one day Jesus is coming back, just because he didn't today doesn't mean he won't tomorrow. Just because he gave you the opportunity to witness to somebody today does not mean that you'll get another opportunity tomorrow. Just because you woke up today does not mean that you're going to wake up tomorrow. They knew Noah preached 100 years. Rain's coming. They don't know what rain is. Get on the ark. They've seen an ark that he started to build. They still don't know what the point of the ark is. God's going to flood the whole world. Get in the ark. For 100 years they'd heard it, but they didn't believe it. The second lesson that we can learn by those swallowed by the sea 
is that if God's speaking, today is the day. You know what each one of them should have done? I firmly believe that if they would have wanted to get on the boat, God would have told Noah to make the boat bigger. But God, being merciful and just, gave every one of them an opportunity, but he knew that they'd all reject it. You know how much room the ark had as much as it needed? I believe if somebody would have come up and said, Noah, I believe that God told you to build the ark, but I believe that I need to get on the ark, but my family wants to get on with me. And I don't think you got enough room in the ark. I believe God would have told that guy to build an ark. He's saying, that's silly. I believe that God would have made a way. But nobody came. Nobody listened. Hundred years. Look back a hundred years in America and see how much things have changed. For 2,000 years, people have been preaching Jesus is coming back. Nobody thinks so. They might know that he's going to come back one day. They don't think he's coming back today. They don't think he's coming back tomorrow. Maybe there was somebody that in Noah's day thought, well, when I feel the first drop of rain, that's when I'll get right with God. God shut up the boat before the flood came. Told Noah to get on the boat, and then it says God shut the door. That's how you knew that nothing was going to open the door except God. Because if he shut it, it wasn't coming open. If Noah wanted to, he couldn't open the door for somebody to get on. God said that's the time limit. I mean, Aunt Lynn, I think that you waited one day too late. Well, what do we get to glean from that today? He said, Brother Jordan, I'm saved. I'm on my way. Hallelujah. But has God been telling you to do something that you've been waiting just one more day? God been dealing with you about something that you'll say, well, I'll let go of it tomorrow. I'll get busy on that next week. Well, I'd rather meet God rather than having to stand before His judgment and say, Lord, I waited too long. I'd rather be able to stay and say, Lord, I didn't always do what I was supposed to, but when I surrendered, I gave it my best. It wasn't always what I was supposed to be, but I did try my best once I gave it over to you. It wasn't always what I was, but, but tomorrow, today, I can be what God wants me to be. Can't affect yesterday, tomorrow may never come. Today, I can choose to be what God wants me to be. But then on the other side, knowing that there's coming a day when I may be gone by the end of the day. I don't know what's going to By God and through God do all things consist. Perhaps supposedly. Okay. We got a history in the family of, you know, migraines and aneurysms. I could have an aneurysm and die by the time I get done teaching this Sunday school lesson. I don't know what's going on. That's all in his hands. I'm not worried about it. What am I worried about? That if I could be gone by the end of the day, what if now's the last day that I get to tell somebody about Jesus? What if today's the last day that I've got to show somebody how much I appreciate them in Christ? What if today's the last day that I hear a message from the church before something happens that God's been trying to prepare me for for who knows how long? Because God's faithful and God's long suffering. But today's the last chance you've got to get prepared for the spiritual warfare that you're getting ready to fight. The lesson of those that were swallowed by the sea is that they listened, but they didn't hear. They didn't believe. If they'd have believed Noah, they'd have changed the way that they're living. If they'd have believed Noah, they'd have gotten on the boat or made their own boat. If they had believed Noah, they wouldn't have lived the life that God poured his vengeance out upon. What was it? They were, every thought, every desire of man was evil continually. But see, second, as an example, we see Sodom and Gomorrah. What was Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah was not just that they were evil continually. According to verse number 7 of your 
text this morning, it says, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth in an example. They not only rejected God, they perverted the creation of God. They took things that God intended to be and then changed the natural orders of things to glorify themselves, to glorify the, f the flesh. But we know that the Bible teaches that all sin, right, there's the pride of life, there's the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh. It's either because you well up with pride and you want to do it. There's the lust of the eyes, which it looks good, so I want to have it. And then there's the lust of the flesh. It feels good, so I want to desire to have it. Sodom and Gomorrah was so wicked and perverse that they saw everything, they tried everything, and they welled up with pride and said, I bet we can have more fun if we do things ways that God never intended us to do it. They were so given over to lasciviousness, is the Bible term, where they were willing to not only defile themselves, they were willing to pervert and defile things that hadn't even entered into the consciousness of man up to that point. Why? Because they were chasing a thrill. They were chasing a high. It was all about what they felt in the moment. Well, what happened to them? God poured out vengeance upon them. In fact, the vengeance that God poured out on them was so powerful that God said, if you turn around and look at it, you're going to die. You can't even see the wrath that I'm getting ready to pour out. Why? Because God's wrath is poured out in holiness. What did God say? No man can see me and live. Why? Because he's holy. God's vengeance is an extension of himself. You can't see the vengeance of God and live to tell the tale. Because you know what God's vengeance is? He puts out his expectation. And he said, here's what I expected. And because it's holy, guess what happens to everything that's not holy? It's consumed. I will remind you, our God is a consuming fire. You know why that is? Because anything that isn't holy can't approach a holy God. You know why we're able to enter in, according to the book of Revelation, as a priest into the very throne room of God and pray to Him directly without immediate... You know why that is? Because we're not robed in our righteousness. We're robed in the righteousness of Christ. We're not consumed because He sees the visage of His Son. We're able to walk through that veil, so to speak, as the Old Testament example. What's the veil? The separation between man and... There is now, therefore, no condemnation to them that believe. Why is that? Because the veil was rent. The division between man and God was satisfied by Christ. In fact, when the veil was rent in the temple on the day that Jesus was crucified, guess how it was rent from top to bottom? God split it. Man didn't discover something that was able to say, oh, we figured God out. We can now approach God. No. Why did it happen? Because God made a way. God planned the way before He made it the world why do you think Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life because he was the way before there ever was a problem they had the solution long before man ever made the problem so then imagine how it is for Sodom and Gomorrah God knowing that he's already made a way think of it this way when God made the world he knew that his son was going to have to die for the thing that he was creating and he made it anyway and every day that passed after Adam and Eve sinned, God knew that each one of the sins man was committing, Christ has already died for in the eyes of God because God's all places at all times. In God's eyes, Christ has already paid everything. He had already died for what they were getting ready to do and they still rejected Him. And they continue to give themselves over to more lasciviousness and more and more and more. They had angels walk in amongst them and they didn't even know it. All they knew is that them fellas is different and we want to get to know them. Not in a good way. 
The angels went, about went out there and went wild west on them. And Lot said, no, stay in here. Right? It was Lot's long suffering that saved them fellows that was at the door. But then the angels walked out and smote them all with blindness. But what happened? They had to lay hold on Lot and his family and drag them out of the city. Sodom and Gomorrah stands as an example. You may be a righteous and just man, but if you dwell among lasciviousness with no, if you're just relying on yourself, you won't even have enough common sense that when God shows up and says, hey, y'all need to leave town, God had to grab them and drag them out of the city. You live, and if you're vexed among the world long enough, you won't even understand the voice and the commandments of God anymore. They showed up and said, Lot, it's time to go. And Lot tried to reason. Lot tried to buy more time. Lot tried to understand what was going on. Lot didn't understand. Lot's wife was told, don't turn around. You know what happened? Them angels took a can of the vengeance of God and God poured it out. Well, what happened to Lot's wife? She turned around, she turned into a pillar of salt. I wonder, I just think about this. Lot wasn't around, wasn't allowed to turn around. So if Lot was walking out first, how do you know that his wife got turned into a pillar of salt? He wasn't allowed to turn around and see what happened. You know who wrote that story? That Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Well, who told Moses? God told Moses. That's why Moses wrote it down. But we do know she was turned into a pillar of salt. We know that she turned. Why? Because... Her feet were pointing that way. Her heart was back in lasciviousness. Granted, she just left a couple of children and children's in law in that city. How many of you could walk out of a city knowing it was going to be destroyed and not turn around and at least have the desire to go back and get your youngins? Or maybe they had children, your grand youngins. Don't falter. I haven't walked in them shoes. But I do know she wasn't supposed to turn around and gaze on the vengeance of God. Maybe she was turning around because they told them God's going to destroy the city. And they laughed at him. They laughed at Lot, his daughter's husband. Maybe she was turning around and saying, I wonder if they've seen common sense yet. But she turned into a pillar of salt. You know what a pillar is? That's something solid. I don't know why she turned around. I know she turned around. You know what Lot's wife in this tale of Sodom and Gomorrah? Nothing's worth turning around and gazing back at. I don't care what it is. If it chose to stay in your past and not come with you, you can't drag it along. You can hook chains up to it and wear a V8 in that truck out trying to move it. But it's anchored in the past. It's anchored in the world. You can't move it. God has all power to move it. But whatever it is, it has to choose to come with you. Now, a lot being heartbroken, maybe his girls who are walking behind him, maybe it was Lot, his wife, and then the children behind them. I don't know. But maybe one of the youngins says, Dad, Mom, look back. Lot can't look back. He can't see that she's been turned into a pillar. Why? Because if he turns around and sees it, he's going to be turned into a pillar of salt. Lot can't look back. He's got to keep on going. That's hard. That's rough. But you know what that pillar of salt means? You know what did Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Chapter number 5, book of Matthew. If the salt has lost its savor, what's it good for? Cast out and be trodden under the feet of men. He said, ye are the salt of the world. Salt, according to Jesus, go read the Sermon on the Mount. He said, was meant to preserve 
to push back to stay the appointment or the time that man has to face God and God's judgment. Ye are the salt of the earth. By your actions, maybe you could just one more day give somebody else an opportunity to remind them, to present them with the choice that you can get right with God today. But if you don't get right with God today, there's coming a day where it'll be too late. That by you going out and spreading the message, it puts the fear of God back into people. And for one more day, people are willing to just go out and do what God wanted them to do rather than what they wanted to do. There's a whole lot of... Don't have time to get into that whole lesson. Okay? But, as salt being preservatives, you know what Lot and his family didn't do while they were in Sodom? They didn't spread too much salt. How do you know that? Because the evil continued to grow and to wax worse and worse. Now, I've heard our pastor preach, and there's nothing in the Bible that contradicts it. Nothing in the Bible that says it either. But I do believe, I agree with them, that if Abraham, if Lot would have chosen to take the plains rather than the cities, I believe Abraham would have won Sodom and Gomorrah to the Lord. Why? Because Abraham preserved the places that he went. Abraham didn't back up on what God had given him and what God had told him. I believe if they'd asked him, what are you doing? According to the book of Hebrews, I believe that he would have looked at him and said, I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Y'all want to come with me? I believe he would have invited them. You know why? Because Lot wasn't told to go, but Abraham invited him. God told Abraham to take him and his wife and to get out of town. Well, who did he take with him? He took his nephew, Lot. Lot, we're going to see what God wants for us. So you want to come with us? Abraham was always willing to tell somebody about the Lord. Abraham was always willing to live for the Lord regardless of what came his way. I believe Abraham would have spread a little bit of salt through Sodom and Gomorrah. So why do you think that Lot's wife was turned into a salt? Or a pillar of salt? Because she was supposed to preserve others. She was supposed to spread that salt. The knowledge of what God expected from them. They knew that Lot was a righteous man. They put him in charge of the gate of the city to judge because they said that man knows right and wrong. He knows right and wrong better than us, which, yeah, he did because they didn't know what up and down was anymore. They'd given themselves over to such wickedness. But they said, if we want somebody who knows what's right and what's wrong to be a judge, we want that guy. Because they knew that Lot knew right and wrong. But they knew that he knew right and wrong. They didn't understand how important it was for them to know what right and wrong was. All that salt that should have been spread, God set her up as an example, not just to that city. God said, you didn't preserve that. So I'll turn you into salt as a warning for every generation. Well, how long ago was that? Uh, if I was to put a number on it, I'd say about oh, 5,000 years ago. Why do you say that, Brother Jordan? Because give or take 500 years. That's what the Bible says. But in her lifetime, how old was she? I don't know. But you know what I do know? In her life, she preserved very little. She didn't even instill in them two daughters that hadn't been married yet the importance of being virtuous and righteous. Go and study what they did after they left the town. Her life didn't preserve much around her. But God used her to preserve a single message. The world ain't worth it. How long has that message been going? Over 4,000 years. God made her an example. Why? Because it's worth learning. He made Sodom and Gomorrah into an example. Why? Because it's worth learning. But not just, look at King Saul. First king of Israel. Head and shoulders stood above every man. Started off humble man. He was great when he was small in his own eyes, the Bible says. But when he got too big for his britches, problems started happening. You ever study out the life of Saul? The day that Saul chose is one day, one decision. You don't know how one decision could change the course of the rest of your life. Especially if you're unrepentant for it, which is what. Saul was 
He was supposed to go and he was supposed to kill the king. He was supposed to kill all the people. He was supposed to kill all the cattle. He was to annihilate the enemy of God. And when the man of God showed up, Samuel, he says, Lo, or hey, listen to that. What's this bleeding of sheep? What's all that animal noise going on outside the tent? King Saul. God said to destroy it all. So I said, oh, yeah, I know that's what God said, but we thought we'd do it this way, and that we'd offer up a sacrifice unto God. He was trying to justify why he did what he did. And you know what the cost was? God said, you're not going to be king over Israel no more. He said, starting today, I am not on your side, Saul. The spirit that overshadowed the king of Israel as when Saul was king, it left. And you know what it was replaced with? A troubling spirit from the Lord, the Bible teaches. Devil didn't get a hold of Saul. God got a hold of Saul. God already had a hold of Saul. But he took that spirit that gave wisdom and you know peace and discernment, the thing that David so longed for in his life. Right? He took that away and he replaced it with a troubling spirit from the Lord. Don't think that God don't know how to upset your apple cart in just the right way to get your attention. From that day forward, Saul, that spirit troubled him so much, Saul would go into fits of mania and lunacy. It'd drive him so nuts that the very person that was doing their best to help him, David, who would try to play songs to the, drive that troubling spirit away, to give him a little bit of rest and a little bit of comfort. David loved Saul. Most importantly, he loved him because that was God's anointed. Three times David could have killed Saul, but he said, I will not touch the anointed of God. That's God's man who was anointed to do God's work. I ain't, God's going to take care of him. I don't have a right to touch him. But that man that's playing the music to try and soothe his very spirit, he'd pick up a javelin and throw it at him out of anger and jealousy because he knew that he had a touch from God that Saul used to have and didn't have no more and would never get again. You know what the example of Saul teaches us? Obedience is greater than sacrifice. That's what Samuel told him. Saul said, well, yeah, I didn't kill the king, and I didn't kill all the animals, but we was going to take those animals and sacrifice them unto God. That didn't even make sense. Those were defiled and filthy animals. God didn't want that sacrifice. But even if they were clean and pure in the eyes of God, untainted, because if a sacrifice was tainted, guess what you had to do? Throw it off the altar and start all over again. But Saul had gotten to the point where he could rationalize anything. It's better to just do what God said. It was a whole lot easier to do what God said than to do what Saul intended to do. But what was the core problem with Saul? Saul used to think that he was unworthy, but then he got to a point where he thought he was worthy. And then he thought he was worthy of more than what he had. Why do you think he took all them livestock and animals? He was going to go have a big old feast back at the house. He wanted to increase the coffers. It's the same thing that Achan did. God told him not to touch the accursed thing when Israel went into the promised land. They took over, you know... God took down the walls of Jericho and then they walked in and took everything with it. God said, don't take nothing. What they can do. Took a wedge of gold, silver, Babylonian garment. They had just walked out. Well, they hadn't just walked out. About 40 years ago, they had walked out with all the gold and the riches and the livestock of all of Egypt. But that wasn't enough for Achan. But we deserve to have that given to us because all that we went through as slaves for 400 years. And we just won this city. We deserve to take their gold too. No, you deserve nothing. But God, honoring his promise to their father Abraham, led them out so that they could become that great nation that he promised them that they would be. 
that the people would number more than the stars is what God said. And then they get to where God wants them to be, but instead of desiring what God intended for them to have, no, I want that. What was Saul's desire? This is what God wants. I want that. It's a lesson in pride. I ought not want what God doesn't want me to have. You know what I should want to have? What God wants me to have. And if God don't want me to have it, or tells me not to get it, it's for a reason. It's either for my betterment, or it could be indifferent to me. It may have no impact on me, but it's going to have an impact on those around me. And if God says no, guess what that means? I don't want it. It's not a matter of, well, God said no, so I'll ask again tomorrow. No, if God says no, I ought to change and pray, Lord, change my heart to where I don't desire it. Remove the temptation. Give me the strength to say, not just no, but I don't even want it anymore. But then the last example, if we go to the book of Judges, we find out about a man named Samson. Samson had the job. You know what Samson's job was? Well, he's found in the book of Judges for a good reason. God made him judge over Israel. You know what Samson's job was? To teach the people what God said was right and wrong. And then when matters would come up where they said, we don't know about this, Samson would judge according to what thus saith the Lord. It was his job to steer the people. Go read in the book of Judges. It says, before Israel had a king, God saw fit that he would raise up judges to lead them in what God said. God was their king, and the judges were God's spokesperson. They would say, this is what God said, and this is what y'all ought to do. Well, if they didn't do it, they had to pay the price. But in the times of the judges, Samson was used mightily of God to defend the people of God from the Philistines. But somewhere along the line, Samson decided that he didn't want to do his duty. You know all that time that he was down there womanizing and chasing after Delilah and everything else? You know where he was supposed to be? Back in Israel doing his job as a judge. Where was he? He was in the, a strange land chasing after a strange woman for strange reasons. Think I'm kidding. Samson was married. Wasn't a good husband either. He called his wife a cow. Just say he called it her heifer. That's what the Bible says. That's good. Miss Sharon, how would that fly? <laughs> if, Brother, if Brother Charlie pulled that, I don't care, Navy, been on submarines, he'd be whooped, I promise you. Right? And I could see Joseph sitting there and giggling the whole time as he's watching. But that wouldn't fly nowadays. Imagine how much more it wouldn't have flown back then. He calls her a cow and then goes and cheats on her continually. Right? He's a sorry man spiritually. You know, I don't believe he started that way. God doesn't choose an unworthy vessel to use for his honor and his glory. Show me once where God calls somebody that isn't in the right position to be called. You know what the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, you know where God called him at? Right where he needed to be. Show me where Saul of Tarsus had to go out and change who he was before God would come back and save him. No. God saved him then and there. Show me once where God says, I want you to come and be, be mine and I want to be yours. Isn't that what the psalmist said? I am his, I am my beloved, and he is mine. So, Show me one time where God said, here's a list for you to go and do. In fact, I see that there was a rich young ruler one time that said, Lord, here's everything that I've done. And he said, that's cool. But sell everything you got, give it to the poor, and then follow after me. That wasn't a list where he said, if you do this, you're going to be holy. It was showing the rich young ruler his desires weren't for the things that he had claimed to have done for God. He desired to do all that so that God would bless him with the things that he had. He didn't want Jesus. Well, how do you know that? Because Jesus said, you can have me. 
All you got to do is give up all that. I believe if he'd have sold it all, there'd have been a thirteenth disciple. Why? Because he said, "Follow after me. Go sell it. Give it all. Come." And he said, "Nope." He did the same thing that Samson did. Samson knew what God wanted him to do. You know what he did? The exact opposite. Same story as Jonah. Same story as we can go to the days of the Apostle Paul. Diotrephes, the one who loved to have the preeminence. We don't know what Alexander the coppersmith did, but we know that he did evil to the man of God. You know what that means? He did the opposite of what God wanted him to do. There's a whole bunch of people that haven't learned from the examples. How do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because you go from one book to the next, to the next, to the next, to, and people are still doing the same things. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us there's nothing new under the sun. Man's still doing the same things for the same reasons. People today still making the same mistakes. Why? Because they did not learn from the examples that God made. They did not hearken unto what God said. Even today. We've got Christians saved for years, decades even, struggling with things that God said on a long time ago. What do you think that does? Puts them in captivity, in bondage. They return back to a place where they are not free as the Son made them. The Son said you're free, free indeed. But what do they do? They become ensnared with the affairs of this world. The Apostle Paul said somewhat forsook it, having loved this world, this present time. You know what all of those characters had? They had a problem with what they loved. Because whatever you love, whatever you cherish, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. You know what Saul wanted? Saul wanted to be a bigger king. Saul never realizes he only got as big as God let him be. Because there's only one king, and that's God. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. You know what Sodom and Gomorrah found out? They were without excuse. Even if Lot and Abraham and everybody else, they knew what they was doing was wicked. But when righteousness came by their way, a just man walked in, they looked at it and said, we can change him and turn him into one of us. Instead of saying, we need to change and become like him. They didn't understand that there was a need and that the need needed to be addressed a whole lot sooner than they thought they didn't have as much time, just like in Noah's day. You know what the biggest indictment on them in their time is? They didn't believe. They didn't have faith. You know what Noah found? Grace in the eyes of God. Why? Because up until that point, he's the last one going around doing and acting by faith, just trusting that what was handed down to him from his ancestors was true and that he's going to believe God. Then we got Samson, who thought, I can go and do what I want to do and still be used of God. It was for a while. The only reason Samson still had strength, even after he had stopped doing his duty, because God kept his promise. God said, you don't cut your hair, I'll give you great strength. God said, if it ever gets cut, it's going to be gone. So Samson thought he could go be He-Man and whoop the Philistines all the time and that he'd be doing what God wanted him to do. Well, these are the enemies of God, but what did God want Samson? He didn't want Samson to be a general. He wanted Samson to be a judge. And he rejected his duty, and guess what happened? It caused him to die. He was taken captive. He was forced into harsh labor. And he slew more Philistines in his death than he did in his life, but he still died with them. Samson got what he wanted. Guess what it cost him? Everything. Don't forget the examples. 
But more importantly, don't just forget the exa- don't forget the lesson behind them. Countless examples, end samples in the Old Testament given why for our end sample, our teacher, so that we know what's right, what's wrong, and what God has to say about certain things. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.